Uh, and, and my only job, in, in a way, is just to, uh, especially to, uh, to welcome Josh back to the school. It's great to see you again. And, and, uh, um, and to introduce Galia Solomonov, who will then introduce the serious speakers of the evening. But, I mean, the Istanbul week actually started already with the Elastic City Walks downtown. And it's a really um, incredibly complicated week in which none of us know exactly what's happening when. And it's very confusing, um, like, is it somebody that's from Istanbul who's here or somebody from here that's working in Istanbul or all of the different combinations? Is it, are they artists, business people, real estate developers, architects, politicians? You know, it's very, very confusing. And that's what we love, of course, is that we now have a deep, that's what confusion is, a deep relationship with, with Istanbul and with uh, Turkey in general. And this is sort of, um, in a way, just taking advantage of the, of the pleasure of this relationship, which will become much more formal with the opening of, uh, of the Studio X in, in Istanbul at the beginning of uh, November. And I think tonight is just such a perfect example because, you know, not as it, is, is it a building with a super interesting team uh, directed by somebody who's been teaching here, but the project would have been somewhere else on the west coast and then flipped and found itself in Istanbul and then like four days afterwards started to be constructed. And also it's an amazing client because it's not just fashion, but it's also chocolate of an unbelievably good quality. Um, <laughs> And music, like the best, the, the number one uh, radio station uh, in Turkey. So an incredible confusion of, uh, of culture. So the, so the Vako family, which has a great dignity and creativity going back for generations, is, is not just going back for generations, but has a totally sharp uh, awareness of, of modern life and modern life in Turkey, which is not the same modern life in Turkey as modern life anywhere else, which is why we're so thrilled with the um, Studio X uh, that, that are open soon. So anyway, just to, to, to welcome uh, Josh and the team back and to int introduce you to the wonderful Galia Solomonov, who is going to be your host this evening uh, for this ride, which, which the, the, this part of the Istanbul week, which is happening in the school, is really running now pretty much every day, uh, all the time. I think if we had twice as many events in Istanbul week, we still would be, it would still be just a small uh, gesture towards the excitement that we feel and the complexity of the situation and of course you guys know, know perfectly having a downtown office uh, working all over the world and now finding yourself working in Istanbul and suddenly realizing uh, in which ways uh, Istanbul plays the role that it has played for so long. Uh, for those of you who have never been to um, Istanbul I can only express my sorrow um, and commiserate with you. Um, but just to say one small thing, um, w if you dig a hole in Istanbul, you find another civilization. So when you, pl when, when you do contemporary work in Istanbul, you are very acutely aware that you have become one more archaeological layer on a depth that you will not find anywhere else in the world. And of course, uh, it's a city absolutely always poised between many things. So it's always a city that, uh, it's not just a city with a beautiful water flowing through the middle of it, it's actually a city that's itself always uh, floating, always uh, uh, swimming, uh, and so we are jealous of Istanbul. This is really why we set up a Studio X, we're just brutally uh, uh, jealous. So uh, thanks, Josh, for, for launching this off, but I give you Galia Solomonov, um, wonderful teacher and leader in the school, Galia. Um. Usually we have one architect talk about many buildings. Tonight we have one building being talked by many designers. And so it's, uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce to you uh, the WACO headquarters, um, a building uh, done by an incredible team uh, led by Joshua Prince Ramos, um, who um, other projects include the Willy Theater, uh, in Dallas, and who before Rex was a founding par partner of OMA in New York City, uh, and with whom I had the pleasure to work many years ago uh, in Rotterdam. Um, the other member of the team is Ishtiak Rafiuddin, uh, who was his on-site architect uh, for the project, and it's a project architect at Rex today. Uh, David Menikovic, um, who was a project manager for this project, and it's a PhD candidate at CASE, 
uh, doing architectural research uh, with, um, in, in, within that group. Um, uh, the, um, Mark um, Simmons, of, uh, a founding partner of Front, uh, which is a much more than a facade consultant. It's, it's a firm that uh, affirms and makes possible for uh, incredible form to take um, to happen. Um, and it's also the chair in architectural design, design at Georgia Tech uh, and teaches a very unique form of uh, integrated design um, a studio that goes from design to a prototyping uh, of parts and model making. Uh, we also have uh, Sefer Kaglar um, of Autobahn who work on the interiors for the project. Uh, and with me, uh, the discussion will be um, conducted with Marva Kaglar, uh, who is the director of Saha uh, in Istanbul. Uh, the WACO, the, the, the building, uh, is um, a building for a um, family or a client that has a, uh, a fashion and a media component in this firm. And before this reincarnation, the building was part of these build buildings were designed for the Annenberg Center. And when that project got canceled, a lot of the research and interest generated for that project was then uh, channeled to this um, building that needed to be resolved in a very short amount of time and in a very different part of the world. And, and so that's the mythology. That's what I know from researching in the web and then Today we will have the pleasure of knowing the many side of the stories that make a building. Many times when you have a person giving uh, a raconte of 20 projects um, in an hour, you get this fantasy overview of how architecture is generated. And tonight we're going to try to do something very different that is really understanding in depth how a building comes together, how people from different parts of the world and different sensibilities uh, find ways of making something happen. And building, it's all about consensus. You need people to agree. You need people to place the money, leave it there, trust the team, and get things done. And so today we'll get the story of how that happened in 2010 uh, in uh, Turkey. Uh, I leave you with uh, Joshua Ramos. Thank you. Uh, so I get the pleasure of giving that um, sort of glossy overview, uh, which unfortunately will straddle my colleagues with attempting to justify some of the crazy things I'm going to have the pleasure to say. Um, let's see if the clicker works. Yes, the clicker works. Uh, so in order to present the project, I have to give you first an overview of a previous project, which is a sad story. So it's going to go from a sad story, an even sadder story, and then ultimately to what I hope will be a very exciting story. Um, the project, in a way, had its inception in 2006, when we were commissioned by Caltech uh, to create an interdisciplinary building uh, for their campus. Now, if you don't know about Caltech, Caltech gets 10 times more federal funding per capita than any other institution in the United States. Okay, so they're rich. They're crazy rich. And this is the campus, right? It's in Pasadena, just behind the Hollywood Hills. It is about 72 to 73 degrees, about 95% of the year. So they're rich and they're in paradise. <laughs> and if you know anything about our practice, our practice is constantly trying to find root problems and trying to find innovative solutions to them. And in this case, there were no root problems, right? Everything was perfect. And in fact, the only problem we could figure out uh, the, the IST Center, its intent was to bring together uh, 16 Nobel Prize winners from all different kinds of um, intellectual pursuits, from applied and computational mathematics to theoretical physics and so forth, uh, precisely because there's a belief now that historically we saw all these preoccupations diverge, and now we're seeing them all come back together again. So there was a desire to put these all, all these uh, thinkers into a single building to kind of see what would germinate if, in fact, all these strings would come back. A center. 
Um, and the only problem that we could actually really find is that they wanted an intellectual center that wasn't physically in the center of the campus. That was about it. You were going to be a tough crowd. Um, okay, so this was the initial proposal. Uh, I'm not going to go into it very much, but it was a, a horizontal plate that would allow all of the faculty and their entourage, if you will, to be reorganizable based on their needs. Uh, all of the recitation areas, the, the, the study areas were then put in this kind of very exciting tower. And Caltech really encouraged us to use uh, new forms of enclosure technologies that they had been developing, which you see there, um, sort of become this kind of like large cocoon. Uh, you might like it, you might hate it. It was clearly quite ugly. We sort of found a certain pleasure in its ugliness. Um, we went all the way through concept design. Uh, the faculty approved it. The president approved it. We seem to be on the verge of getting approval for commencing schematic design. And for any of you who have practiced, you know that that's a really delicate moment because it's not really clear if concept design is not approved, who's on the hook for it? Right? Do you just keep redesigning at your own expense? Are they going to pay you? What is actually going to happen? Um, we thought we would get approval, and instead we got a letter that said, ah, we forgot to mention you need to have this building approved by the Pasadena Design Commission. Now, you don't know anything about Pasadena. Pasadena is incredibly conservative, and it's all Spanish style. So we took this to the Design Commission, feeling very confident because the university had fully approved it, and said, look, there's nothing to worry about. And we didn't get more than about three minutes into the presentation, they just said, no. No, no, we're not going to build a big cocoon on campus. Uh, it must be Spanish style. Um, now, this is a moment in which I learned not to try to intellectually outwit people who are much smarter than you are. Um, the president at the time of Caltech was a Nobel Prize winner who had actually won the Nobel Prize because he was the first person to be able to uh, identify the markers in virology that allowed people to start to attack the AIDS virus. You know, not a slouch. And I'd been telling him over and over again about how constraints are opportunities. So I went to him and I said, hey, look, you know, Spanish style, we don't really know how to do Spanish style. Um, how about we just do our really cool kind of weird building that we've developed that's supposed to be an attractor, and you just go down the street and you find someone who will do a Spanish style box, and that'll be really cool, right? Who's ever done that before? this weird kind of Spanish style enclosure. And he looked at me and he said, no, no, you've been telling me about this whole uh, constraint is the mother of opportunity. Isn't it just a great constraint? I think you should go back and redesign. So we hit that panic moment of now we were redesigning on our own dime and worse, we really liked this client. We didn't want to piss them off. We didn't want to start you know, trying to make a, a, a contractual argument for what we should do. And we panicked for about three weeks until this moment. I don't exactly know where I'm supposed to be pointing this just to advance. Oh, I guess you pointed up the screen. All right, the matrix, Neo. This is the root of our observation. He asks, what is the secret behind bending the spoon? And we're gonna find out now your ages if you can answer this question. What is the secret? There is no spoon. So we realized after three weeks of panicking that the problem was not the design, the problem was the design commission. So we needed to redesign the design commission. So we asked Caltech, who has obviously a lot of political clout in Pasadena, to allow us to present first on the day that they were going to approve or not approve about 60 garage additions, all of whom have people who have historic houses, some of which are very beautiful modernist houses that somehow got grandfathered in, but now they're gonna to have to add a Spanish style garage who are not going to be particularly happy. And we showed up with two slides. But we were allowed to swear, Columbia, because I'm about to swear. But, um, so this is the first slide. First moment in front of the design commission. So all of you are effectively all these families who are ready to get pissed off. And we said, okay, Pasadena Design Commission, over the last 85 years, you have, in fact, legislated Spanish style, Spanish style. But weirdly, modernism, modernism, brutalism, neo-modernism, bad, now, in fact, if you really squint, the only thing you have su uh, successfully legislated over the last 85 years is the color beige. <laughs> and this really cool uh, material that was being developed by Caltech is what color? Beige, 
So you should allow us to move forward. And this is the swearing moment. All shit broke loose. Okay? People were screaming and yelling and saying, you know, why do I have to do a garage edition? That thing's modernist. You guys approve it. And we just kind of snuck away. Um, three weeks later, no, really, this has something to do with Istanbul. Um, three weeks later, we got a letter in the mail from the Design Commission that simply, it's like, you know, go away. It said simply, you can move forward if it's three stories, austere, with a ground floor arcade. We're like, okay, that we can handle. So we created the Wolf and Sheep's Clothing Building. And the idea was, you know, kind of like these um, sea slugs that, that walk up to something and completely invert their stomach and then reinvert. So we just took the whole project and went like that, inverted everything. Um, all of the uh, professorial areas and their entourage were now organized in these uh, leveled plates that were effectively uh, a motel. They were constructed that way, super lightweight post entry concrete slabs. Uh, we put the um, fan coil units in the walls. There really is no ductwork that allowed us to have concrete floors and concrete ceilings to greatly reduce the heights of the floors so we didn't have to have intermediate levels and stairs and so forth. You know, incredibly elegant, lightweight, simple structure that would blow over in a wind. And then we took all of the recitation areas, all of the teaching areas, and we made this kind of angry and steel knot in the center. Right, and there you see this idea of bent plates and using the notion of moment of inertia, uh, if you simply start to bend flat sheets, uh, you increase this moment of inertia, and if you can organize it such that you have two diagonals per floor per face, you create an idealized braced frame. So the result was something that looked like this, and we still got Caltech's really interesting material on the top. And when we presented this now about five weeks later, which we had eaten ourselves, but we were scared that they were going to want to now get into the details of it and change the design. Uh, they would say, well, can't we move this element over? And we said, well, no, because the brace frame will fall apart. They said, yeah, we don't really believe that. So they had their own engineers look at it and say, no, it's true. You really can't change anything. It will fall apart. And that allowed us to get straight through concept design into approval and start schematic design. Um, this is not a story I tell to clients. Um, there you see the interior. Uh, and the exterior, this is how they build it. They build this really angry kind of ex um, exuberant uh, steel structure. And then they would build this light, lightweight post-tension concrete slab building around the exterior. And lo and behold, it is three stories austere with a ground floor arcade. Voila. Yep. That was a happy story. Uh, there you see this is the last building they built on campus, Spanish style. That was in 2004. And 2007, they were supposed to start to build our building. We were completely done with construction documents, going through bidding and negotiation. And uh, the president, who I had that interesting conversation with, who is an architectural fanatic, left under very unusual and, and sudden circumstances, and the dour Frenchman replaced him, and he shit-canned all the rest of the work. Uh, now, there were five interesting projects going on. By the way, my daughter's in the back, and she's working diligently, and can't hear anything I'm saying, so um, I hope she's not listening to me swear. That would be bad. Um, Morphosis, who had started the astrophysics building literally two weeks before us, they got to build theirs, and all the rest of the projects were stopped. When I say stopped, I mean like we got a letter. It didn't say, hey, we'll get back to you. It was a letter that said, here's your final payment. Um, we'll never call you again. That was it. So 2000, end of 2007, the project not only was shelved, but it simply went away. Uh, and it stayed that way until to the end of 2008. The end of 2008, um, actually right about a period like now, in about three or four weeks, Fashion Week in New York. Fashion Week in New York is about a week. Uh, this gentleman came to Fashion Week on a Monday. On Monday, he found out horrible news. This is uh, Jem Hako. He is the CEO of Vaco, which is the company we're discussing, but also the CEO of Power Media, which is why there's this kind of interesting constellation of two different companies. Um, he is the head of his family's company. Um, his father, Vitali Hako, which is where Vaco comes from, Vitali Hako, had created this company uh, in the 50s. And with an interesting backstory, um, they, they became a high fashion company through what they did. They were the first company in the Muslim world, uh, I should say that notably they're a Jewish family, who created beautifully designed um, headscarves from Muslim women. 
Right? So it's a very interesting and beautiful history, which uh, Jem, who is much more contemporary, had turned into a high fashion company. So when Jem walked into our office on uh, Friday, because uh, on Monday he had found out that his father's headquarters that was built by a member of Siam um, was going to be demolished with eminent domain in 11 months. And the company uh, is held 50% by the family and 50% publicly traded. And if, obviously he was concerned that if, if his headquarters, this really important building, and their factory were to be bulldozed, their stock prices would crash. Um, this was really at the worst moments of the beginnings of the recession, particularly in Istanbul. He was scared that that single act could drive the company bankrupt. Um, when Jem walked into our office, he, by the way, he's about this tall, and he walked in with Giselle Bunchen, who was his muse at the time. Uh, and we were looking at Giselle, and he was talking, and something about 11 months bulldozing, yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah, and still looking at Giselle. And then he says, seeing that we're not interested, but, but don't worry, um, my, my cousin, who is our CFO, on Wednesday bought a building. And so it's just a renovation. So it'll be even faster. It'll be easy. It won't be a problem. That was the moment I kind of stopped and looked at him. He's like, like, Turkish hashish is really good. If you think it's going to be cheaper and faster to renovate an existing structure to make a high piece of architecture, because that was actually what he wanted. Right? He didn't just want a new building. He needed a new building that, in his mind, would put them on the map in order to counteract the bulldozing of his father's uh, headquarters, and it needed to be opened at the same time. Right, so the, the publicity was about the new building, not about the demolition. Um, that was enough to get us interested. This was on a Friday. On Sunday, we went to dinner with him at the Mercer, um, still with Giselle Bunch and, and with the Adam Sandler, strange mix. Um, we spoke about it, and we said, you know, can you show us the building that your CFO bought? He said, yeah, there's the building. We're looking at it, and we said, you know, it weirdly looks like a three-story building that's austere with a ground floor arcade. So <laughs> can we take you back to the office and can we show you this project? So we took him back, we showed him Caltech, he loved it. And the very next day, we flew to Istanbul. We got there on a Tuesday. On Wednesday, we met with his structural engineer. Um, and this was the existing uh, footprint of the structure. You can see it's a, um, a, a U-shape. And I have to say one thing about, about Turkey. Because uh, labor prices are so low, and oftentimes uh, uh, prices for real estate is so low, the developers speculate. And if it starts to look like a project won't pan out, they will simply walk away. And so Istanbul is covered with what I'll call bones. Projects, and this, this building was 25 years old. It had been sitting like this since the mid 80s. Um, and that actually is an interesting factor, you know, we can, that may become some of the discussion that happens later, that in fact there is this interesting infrastructure that is ready to be developed already in terms of its, its bones. Um, so on Wednesday, we looked at how to take this structure and to convert it into the pure donut that was Caltech. Um, interestingly enough, Caltech, because this was intended as a motel, it had exactly the same uh, mechanical systems and concepts as we were had here. <coughs> so the ability to transform it became very simple. Weirdly, it was almost exactly the same footprint and the same floor to floor. That was Wednesday, and on Thursday they started construction, using the construction documents that we had. Now, this is where the, the problem gets kind of interesting, or, or even more interesting. The problem was actually the direct inverse structural problem that we had at Caltech. Caltech, we had this strong, angry steel structural interior holding up a super lightweight concrete exterior. In Istanbul, because as I said, labor and materials are cheap, they don't really spend a lot of time engineering. They just way over to engineer it. And so we had this incredibly robust structural mass. And we didn't have time to do forensic analysis of the structure, and no one could find the structural drawings. So we had to create a new kind of tasty center, right? And that tasty center um, was going to be built out of steel because, believe it or not, in that part of the world, steel would actually be faster construction than concrete. Um, and that steel structure, instead of bearing on the concrete structure, had to actually move independently in an earthquake with slip joints. Um, at this point, we had 60 days or eight weeks before 
we needed the steel to show up on site in order for us to be able to hit the schedule. And in order for it to appear 60 days later, within two weeks, we had to submit the steel mill order. So we theoretically had to design this entire thing in two weeks, which we couldn't do. So taking a page out of what we'd learned from the Seattle Central Library about the, making these sort of integral structural boxes, we took it a step further and we made a series of boxes that conceptually actually be stacked on top of each other at will. Right? It really didn't matter their configuration. We sent that steel to the steel mill. Uh, we knew that six weeks later it would show up on site and we began to play. And that knowing that we could organize these things slopes such that we could always use their rooftops or their interiors for um, vertical circulation, we then began to play like this. So over the course of six weeks, we were trying to play with every combination and permutation that would allow us to have the programmatic adjacencies that we wanted as well as all the proper egress that we needed top to bottom of the building. And by the time the steel showed up, we said, that's the one. That's what you will build. Um, so effectively, you could say, this is what we designed within the interior that was already built. And they literally built it that way. So at this moment, uh, there you see the um, completed ring that used to be shaped as a C this way. Now it is a complete donut, and they see how they've cleaned it up. Um, and almost like uh, alien popping out of the chest of cane is the thing that we designed. And they built it that way by fabricating a series of steel boxes on the neighbor's property that they picked up, craned, and then dropped into the center. Um, so there you see this is the fifth box, the toilet box. Not very uh, nice thing to say, but that's the toilet box. Um, there's the sixth box, the seventh box, and the eighth box. And steel erection took less than one week. And in conclusion, then, like moving from the bottom to the top, this was the um, uh, library. Uh, design center is something that uh, Jim is very focused on, this idea that the company would give back. So it's a, a, a library that has design books and history of, of design books. Uh, this is a museum also in the plinth that was dedicated to the designs that his father had done and then carrying it into the more contemporary uh, high design traditions. Uh, this is the auditorium slopes. We use the ceiling of the auditorium actually to be the main entryway. So there's the ceiling, ceiling of the auditorium taking you from the entry into level one. Level one, you move up to level two through the showrooms. Level two, you move up to level three. By the way, I think that is ish. Uh, up through the meeting rooms, and finally it takes you up to the top, which is the headquarters. Uh, and there's Jim sitting in his office. Uh, 13 months later, we missed the schedule by two months. And so there's the thing we designed. Uh, these are real photographs. Right? They're not doctored. This is the moment I talk about, like, one of the interesting constraints of this project was simply time. When we first proposed to Jim that we would cover all these boxes with mirror glass, he was kind of panicked. He was panicked in our office. He said, well, I gotta think about it. In fact, he doesn't speak English very well, so he didn't even say that. He just looked panicked. I'm like, you know, Jim, you, you got all the time in the world, but you're the one with the clock ticking. So if I were you, I'd make a decision quick. Um, he took the bold decision and went forward with it. We, I have to admit, it was a bit of a joke, sarcastic, but we still thought it was beautiful. The idea that Giselle Bunchen would be in the building, the idea of replicating her a million times by um, having mirrors reflecting onto each other. Um, so that was, as I said, the thing in the center, and then it got dumped into the existing structure. And this now comes into the, the discussion that Mark will, will actually add much more to. Um, the enclosure. And what do we do with the enclosure? Now, Jem was really focused on this idea of somehow putting the name of the company in the facade. He was focused on how Louis Vuitton does it, Coach does it. We were not comfortable with it. We were not comfortable with this kind of overt ornament or decoration. Instead, we wanted to focus on the fact that we had used these existing bones to turn them into something else. Um, because of its profile, Vaco is positioned actually to have a green agenda. And we said to Jim, I should say there's actually two things. There, there's that, and there's also the reality that we were a bit nervous that everyone would think that that really clunky structure that was inside of the building came from us. So there was two agendas at play. One was, could we convince Vaco to actually claim that this is a green building? And i.e. that if you can actually use an existing structure to create your new headquarters and to be proud of it, that that's about as sustainable as you can get. Uh, and at the same time, 
by making a facade that was so transparent that it revealed those inner guts, those guts that weren't designed by us, to make it part of the story so in a way we weren't held accountable for the clunkiness of it. Uh, and the reaction then was, could we design saran wrap? How thin can we actually make um, the perimeter such that it's highly transparent? This goes back to moment of inertia. Uh, if you have just monolithic glass, it will be thick. If you can put emollient around it, it will get thinner. But because we didn't know how the exterior concrete structure would perform in an earthquake, we also didn't really know how it would rack. And therefore, the options to put the glass onto the building, we were pretty much limited to pinning it with four pins, two acting as a curtain wall, and two just kind of keeping it, the lower portion of the glass, from falling off. And if we could actually slump into the glass, its idealized shape, that would make the glass thinner and even more transparent. So if you have four pins, that's the structural shape. And if you could slump the glass in, we can actually use that idealized shape connecting the four pins to create uh, super thin and super strong glass. Uh, and that was the result. Now, there was an interesting moment in doing this in, uh, this is buzzing, I don't know if that's because they're trying to tell me we're out of time or it's out of batteries. Um, we're almost done, or I'm almost done. Um, working in Istanbul at this moment is super exciting. And it's exciting because they're going through their industrial revolution. They have a huge diaspora of uh, workers in uh, the rest of Europe. And because of that, their contracting community went into Europe, became very sophisticated, and is now bringing that technology back into Turkey. Uh, so they can do things such as selectively slump, selectively heat and cool glass, that many, many other places can't actually do. In fact, it'd be difficult to do it in the United States. And they also have still an incredibly talented craftsman class. So they were able to have craftsmen build very, very precise jigs that would get burned out every three pieces of glass. So they'd have to have someone that was able to build at incredible preci precision and quickly. Uh, at the same time, they had the technology to selectively slump. And the net result then was what we called saran wrap. You see it in fabrication and then in situ. And the thinness of that glass is part of what gives this building its kind of miraculous thinness. Oh, sorry, uh, transparency. So with that, I will now turn it over, I think, to Mark or Ish or Dava. Uh, so one last image. So that was the thing that we were given. And after 13 months, that was the thing that we gave back. You're on. Hi, good evening. Thank you. Um, my name is David. I was the project manager. Um, what I'd like to introduce tonight are a few points uh, about the unique conditions under which the project was developed, mostly in terms of the design management aspect. And in the background, you'll see once, just run it. Yeah, okay. You'll see images uh, organized chronologically that hopefully will emphasize some of the points that I'm about to make. As, as Josh mentioned before, our main constraint was time. Uh, Rex submitted the design package in 60 days uh, while construction was already under, undergoing. This created a condition where design and construction happened in parallel, compressing uh, and at times collapsing uh, the traditional architectural timeline. Under these conditions and in terms of design, the temporal and spatial role division between the architecture office and the construction site were intertwined allowing us in so many ways an opportunity to experiment with different approaches to the development of the architectural project. Uh, the first point that I'd like to make uh, is uh, the nonlinear nature of the development process. Uh, as Josh mentioned before again, um, we were dealing with a retrofit project, which basically meant that the essence of a clear starting point uh, was problematic and constantly negotiated both as the existing structure was going simultaneously through processes of construction and demolition in different parts, uh, as well as the site which was being negotiated with neighboring property owners and the municipality. This gave us kind of a, a warning sign early on uh, that in order to retain control over the entire project, we will obviously be, we'll need to be very persistent. Uh, but at the same time, we would have to keep a high degree of flexibility uh, vis-a-vis -vis the on-site dynamics. 
and this approach led um, in, a, in a sense to instead of kind of focusing on the different architectural parts as fixed or as non-negotiable, uh, to think much more about the relationship between the architectural parts and treating the parts themselves as variables instead of, uh, of constants. Uh, another aspect of this non-linearity non was the simultaneity of parallel states of project completion, where, for example, on one hand, a power media company was actually being finished, while 30 feet away, uh, the showcase steel structure was actually in full swing. This meant dealing with a wide range of architectural scales simultaneously, which introduced, introduced a degree of complexity, but at the same time allowed us to, in a way, forecast and to constantly adapt our design strategy, uh, for example, for a later to come finishing approach to the showcase and the ring. Throughout the development process, a non-hierarchical feedback loop between the site and the office was maintained, uh, which allowed us to leverage and basically to, to make design decisions either in the office or on the site, depending on the time frame or the complexi or complexity of the issue at hand. Uh, the second point uh, that I I'd like to make is actually uh, the site being a lab, where many of the decisions were based on full-scale mock-ups, making the building its own testing grounds. Uh, this reality depended mainly on a very clear methodology of decision-making on Rex's part. At the same time, the fact that Vac VACO had a very, um, very clear ownership uh, basically one guy that was able to call the shots. Uh, but at the same time, it sprang out of many cultural, uh, local conditions, which uh, basically were a, a very rapid uh, manufacturing and production culture, uh, a type of business engagement that is driven by trust, which means that often uh, the priority is given to a handshake rather to a very complex liability structure in a high level of com communication due to the fact that uh, X was constantly present on, present on the site. The third and last point that I'd like to make is the multidisciplinary approach to the project co coordination, where the availability of and the vicinity between two things that Ish will uh, present after me, uh, between all collaborators allowed moving away from a kind of ver very vertical approach uh, where each problem is dissected into seven, several disciplinary specific solutions, which later need to be negotiated between all the uh, collaborators, to a more uh, multidisciplinary process uh, in terms of the framing of the problem. This was assisted by the development of design analysis and mainly communication tools on site, such as, as I described before, the full-scale mock-ups, but also very large physical models uh, that were placed on the site and allowed all of us uh, to have a very straightforward, intuitive understanding of very complex problems and basically facilitated a very efficient collaboration between all of us. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Ishtiak. Uh, I'm an architect and I had the pleasure to work on Baco from its first uh, concept design phase to basically opening day. Uh, I also had the pleasure to go to Turkey to do design assist for most of the construction. Um, I won't talk too much about the project, but I will basically touch on two points that were kind of critical to uh, the design or us or me being in Turkey. One is about the fact that Istanbul <coughs> was seven hours ahead of New York. And this was important for the workflow between myself, who was in Istanbul, and the rest of the team, primarily David, who was in New York. Uh, and because we were seven hours ahead in time, if we look at, uh, if we compare a typical day between Istanbul and New York, the construction time was typically between eight and five. My working hours in Istanbul were uh, between nine and seven, let's say and there was an overlap between my work hours and David's work hours. And the reason I'm presenting this is because David and I had a pretty, uh, pretty good relationship working together on the project, and part of what made it successful was that we were able to communicate um, in the middle of, at the end of my day, at the beginning of David's day, uh, for about two to three hours. And what that did was, um, when I was on site, I encountered problems um, and issues that needed to be addressed, and we could communicate that uh, at the end of my day, and that allowed the team in New York to 
respond for the day after, essentially. So we essentially had two working days uh, within one day. And because of the speed at which we needed to produce uh, that we were charged with, this was kind of critical to uh, our process and me being in Turkey. And the second thing I want to kind of emphasize is that uh, this is our basically our construction site, uh, which was kind of our playground, as you saw from some of the process images from David. Um, but what you see around the construction site is, uh, was rented by the client as infrastructure for, the, for us building the project. And what I want to make clear is that we, I was sent to Turkey after DD. We did not have a period of making construction documents. So we did the entire project, all the detailing from the site, which was also critical to us um, completing the project in time. So basically, we, that, was, that was my box there, basically. Uh, it's a container with me and uh, an electrical engineer and mechanical engineer. And next to us was a project manager, which included two architects. Uh, next to that was the general contractor, which included managers, architects, and supervisors. The general contractor was our executive architect. So they essentially were doing all the construction drawings and they were almost doing them real time. So they would produce the drawing the same day and almost construct it within that week or you know, relatively soon. And supporting us as well were other engineers, uh, which are part of the design team, uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, as well as the glazing subcontractor. They, were, they had two architects who worked on site and they were essentially doing shop drawings from the site. Uh, and doing surveys on site, as well as the steel subcontractor. They also had an engineer. So essentially we had like this office park of professionals who all participated um, daily. Uh, and there was like vigorous communication between us daily in order to uh, accomplish what we we're gonna accomplish. So those are the two points I wanted to make. And I'm gonna end with uh, a video, a time-lapse video of the entire, entire construction sequence. David showed you some process photos, so this will be more a conclusion to that.
like to introduce Mark Simmons. Wow, ish. That was amazing. I've never seen that video before. It's spectacular. Okay. So thank you very much for having me uh, up as part of this uh, panel discussion. Um, I, I'm just going to talk about only three points, three simple points. Um, uh, the first is the collaborative part of it, which is uh, it's wonderful to have a project end so successfully and to make new friends out of it and uh, sustain old friends, which doesn't always happen. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Josh for about 13 years now and almost continuously during that entire period. And one of the nature of those kind of relationships is that uh, all the projects we're working on and he's working on and often they're the same projects, but other things start kind of coming out in a uh, social and casual way as ideas get exchanged. So work that we're working on and he's doing starts to become kind of cross-pollinating in the discussions. And so this idea of saran wrap you know, it's just a notion, of course, there's lots of other conversations that are going on in regards to saran wrap, but one asks, okay, what material can you use to do that? Well, we can't use plastics because it's going to burn off the building, so it's glass. As soon as we say it's glass, then uh, what is it? And it, uh, you know, there's no shortage of precedence of projects that have slump glass, textured glass, fused glass, all sorts of kinds of glass, uh, uh, in which we've done many of these kind of things. Um, but many of them are, are artisanal or overly artisanal or not uh, engineering oriented, not performance oriented, uh, maybe too willful in their aesthetics or something that is um, uh, about texture and diffusion as opposed to being about um, uh, this kind of transparency, this kind of filigree smoothness that we actually started talking about. And so clearly the idea of doing slumped glass, but with almost no texture, no deformation of the actual surface of the glass, I'll just hi highlight to you, it's actually very unusual, because usually there's either devitrification or texturing or some other process that goes on, and so the idea of saying, let's use a perfectly smooth slump glass that has this kind of transparency, was kind of like the gauntlet. That's now what we want to achieve. Um, there was a prior project to this, which was successful in its own right, done with another architect, using a kind of a Maison de Verre-esque slumping of glass. And over dinner one night, I was telling Josh, it was, it's a beautiful project, but it's kind of working against itself in the sense that the, the folding of the glass creates stress concentrations that create weaknesses. And we were talking proudly of all this um, crazy testing that we had to do in a very short order of time for that project to see if it would not fail. And, you know, he's like, yeah, that doesn't feel right? Like, why, why are you convincing your client to spend all this money on something that has such a high chance of failure? You know, and I'm not criticizing my, my other client, but, you know, that project was, as I say, successful and tested on its own terms and created other kinds of precedents. But the notion then of using the glass slumping as a structural reinforcement that was also kind of natural was also, uh, let's say effortless, was kind of important for us. And we, we knew about projects, of course, like um, Prada Tokyo by Herzog Demeron, which is kind of like a bubble glass geometry. Uh, and there's many others that start to have a kind of similar aesthetic quality. Um, but they all have technical problems, such as, uh, you know, the, the ripping apart of the glass under its own thermal stresses. Or if you have a non-conical or non-cylindrical geometry, it's actually impossible to thermally temper something. So then you say, does it have to be chemically tempered, which is in a very expensive process, just to kind of resist its own kind of design? And, and the answer is really often yes. So in this case here, um, I, I just want to pop in that the performance side of it from an energy standpoint began to kind of drive this. So if, if you look at this glass section here, we've got a kind of a bubble geometry, more like part of Tokyo, then we've got um, a inside light of glass that's following an outside light of glass and they're somehow slumped together forming a slumped insulated glass unit. Um, and there actually have been uh, some projects executed like this which have great challenges. Um, one of the things that we looked at very carefully was the energy performance. As Josh mentioned before, this thing, of course, 
doing an adaptive reuse in an existing building is the most uh, sustainable thing you can do. But beyond that, the, you know, as you've seen, most of this program is actually underground. <laughs> uh, the fenestration ratio is actually inherently relatively low. Uh, the building has some shelf shading components in terms of the double overhang of the building stack. And the upper glass and lower glass is actually highly, highly reflective. It has an excellent solar heat gain coefficient. It's all insulated glass. Now for the most transparent portion, which is chasing the tail down to this kind of tiny little small part of the building, still has a high performance low E coating on it. And one thing I can tell you from doing this many times is you can't do a soft high performance low E coating onto a double curved, locally curved glass. You can do it in a cylindrical geometry, you can do it in a conical geometry using bending tempering furnaces, which basically soften and t uh, curve the glass at, at a much lower temperature. The temperatures that we need to do here on these ceramic molds to locally deform the glass, this is very specialized stuff. So what happens out of this is a kind of a, a recognition that the inside light of glass can be flat from an aesthetic and performance standpoint. And as soon as you do an inside light of glass, it makes this detail non necessary. This detail was a kind of uh, derived from another project which said, let's clamp the inside glass to make it span. The outside piece of glass will just be along for the ride. And you know, we're not going to necessarily engineer them both together. So eventually what came out of this was we said, you know, because as you can see up here, it creates quite a kind of um, a large vertical band at the face of the glass, which would all be fritted, but it wouldn't look as nice as the kind of suppressed panel with the glass kind of floating ethereally over the surface of it. So this detail, by flattening up the interior glass and using laminated glass on the interior, allows us to put a high performance level coating on the glass and to do a countersunk integrated fitting to hold the glass locally, as Josh mentioned earlier, on four points, which actually then those points are fixed and then the bracket connections are seismically released. So where this goes is, this, this is actually kind of helping us structurally. However, there's a problem with this, which is if you're going to do a slumped glass with a flat low E coating on the inside to improve your energy performance, and this is a very technical question, but you are absorbing and re-radiating an awful lot of heat. So the heat in the cavity is getting up to a very high point, and if you actually make your outside piece of glass a dome, the volume of air that's heating up inside, and we did the CFD analysis on it, demonstrates that you blow out the seals of the insulated unit. Actually, it's not even technically viable to do a spherical geometry on top of a flat, low E surface. And so, and I think it was your idea, the idea of actually using a form which is an X, which is structurally efficient to give us the stiffness we wanted, but reduces the volume in the inside cavity of the glass. What it also gives us is it resolves the slumped glass to a perfect straight edge so we can use conventional insulated glass set spacers into the glass at the edges. And to our knowledge, it's the first time in the world this particular configuration of technologies has ever been deployed, all on a fast track at risk project. And this is an incredible kind of testament to the client's vision to support this sort of effort. The third point was what Josh talked about, local procurement. At the time, uh, we were all like looking at uh, Barry Allen and uh, Fusion Glass in the UK and all the various kind of glass, uh, you know, Cursa in Spain, all the people who knew how to do curved slumped glass. And the owner, uh, for all the right reasons, essentially uh, local pride, cost, and uh, basically having control to make something around the corner and the understanding that once you actually, act, you know, you, you actually perfect this technique, it's, it's a commercial asset into the local market. So all those things, we deal with it in 25 different countries around the world, we're very comfortable with that. So Lamb Glass became the kind of nominated partner and everyone started working with them. And so this little series of images from the Mini X to the kind of Medium X, these are just basically concept tests to see whether they could actually get it working and to look at the optical quality of the deformations in the glass. And then eventually, the large one. And you can see there's no low E coatings on this surface of glass. It's actually a monolithic piece of glass. And the deformation is actually very small. I think it's only in the order of 50 millimeters at the very maximum, which means the typical is only about 12 or 15 millimeters wide um, in the offset. And so um, these are all basically the brackets as you saw in the uh, animated sequence going on. 
Uh, and then there's this kind of um, nice sort of fascia panel. So here's the countersunk fitting. And note also that the countersunk fitting is only holding the dead weight of the exterior glass. And there's a series of additional seats that come in underneath to pick up the dead weight of the outside light of glass, which eventually get dialed in. And so those are temporarily located there, but eventually they get pulled back in, but they're permanently embedded in the silicone joints. So there's the fascia panel we're talking about with these kind of like pre-coordinated drilled holes just to let the glass slip past. And then that's pretty much it. And so in the end, you know, these images that everyone's been showing, the kind of amazing phenomenological quality of experiencing this glass under the Turkish light is really what this is about. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know, that kind of experiential quality is just something you really don't see every day. And that's it. Thank you. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Sefer Çağlar. Uh, İç ofisiz, İstanbul'dan. Um, Otoban is an interior design um, office uh, situated in Istanbul. E, bu projedeki görevimiz e, iç mimari danışmanlık ve bazı alanların tasarlanması. So, we, as Otoban, we were in charge of the interior design consulting and design of the some areas of, in this building. Nereye tutacağım acaba? Can someone help me? Nereye tutacağım acaba? Şu an için Rex mimarlık e, oldukça çok çalıştı ve konuyu anlattı. Uh, Rex, in, in Rex Architectural Company has already explained about how they uh, did the building and we also helped them. Evet, bütün hikayeyi anlattı. They, all, they explained about all the story uh, about the building. Evet, çok so zor, e, çok sıkışık e, ve zor zamanlardı bunlar. E, it was very tough uh, because it was, it has to be happened in, in a very short duration of time. Ee, bizim görevimiz e, iç mimari olarak e, Cemakko ile bu, bu alanlara tekrar bakmaktı. So, Ve e, 7 yıldır onunla beraber birçok e, mağazalarını yaptığımız için e, Vakko kimliğine uygun e, danışmanlık yaptık. So we were already been working with Cemakko for 7 years in other buildings. So we know we already knew how he wanted the interior design, interior design, and so we uh, talked with him and talked with him to further improve the interior design quality of the building. Uh, Sorry for my confusion. Okay. Okay. Starting over. <laughs> E, projenin ana kararları iç mimari e, tasarımın e, malzeme seçimlerinde e, yol gösterici oldu. So the, the architectural design was uh, showing us what kind of materials to use in the interior design as well. E, i̇çerideki e, dikey duvarlar aynı zamanda depolama e, düzenleme işlevi gören dolaplardı. The, the vertical columns, uh, the load-bearing columns, were also used as organizational and storage sure. purpose uh, areas. E, bina e, daha önceden var olan bir bina yapıldığı için e, yükseklikler çok zorlayıcı. Bazı iç mimari e, e, yıldız hareketler yapmak gerekliydi. So the this this was an existing building, so we need to use it as a base, and because of the height of the ceiling was uh, 240 centimeters. 
we needed, we needed to use some tricks to adapt it and then do the designing. Örneğin tavanları parlak yapmak ve e, yeşili içeriye almak gibi. So we we tried to use shiny uh, or bright uh, ceilings and try to incorporate the green environment inside of the the building. E, ve e, burada vakfın tarihini e, vakfı binası ilk yapıldığında e, sanat eserleri bu binaya taşındı. So they they they also tried to imitate the first vakfı building by putting inside the art artworks and using easy and simple designs and the library was formed around the fresco of Bedri Rahmi Eybol which was a uh, former poet and uh, author. Evet. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so, if, uh, if there is any questions, of course, we'll take the <coughs> questions too. Um, I, my question, and I have just um, w one question for, especially for the people uh, in the group that teach. Um, as you approach, one of the things that I see in a, when a building is explained in this detail, that a lot of the complexities of the, that are only of the, of the process of construction. They don't really appear in the design phase and rarely appear in teaching architecture. The, it's very difficult to simulate um, the complexity of decisions that go into um, doing a, making the decisions, for example, of the glass or ordering these boxes and, mm -hmm. and, and so in your own personal experience, I know a bit about yours, Josh, but I would also be interested to see how you tell the story. How would experiences before having your own firm uh, from a school on prepare you for kind of leading a project of this complexity and, um, and doing it in such an innovative way? Um, and, uh, actually, there's, I have two ways to respond. The first is definitely, um, you know, the experience that we shared at OMA was an unusual one for people of our age to be dumped into situations that, you know, in some ways we had no, almost no right to be in. To, so to be exposed to um, very complex technical projects uh, with no experience and be putting in a kind of sink or swim environment and, you know, touch wood on many of OMA's works, the, the, the teams managed to swim and to swim quite well. Uh, and so I think that gave a level of confidence at an age that you don't normally have. And you know, if anything I could say about all of Galia's and my colleagues from that period is, there, is that they actually did gain a certain kind of confidence of um, being able to implement ideas uh, that many people don't get until much later in their careers. The flip side that I say didn't prepare us was that at least up until that moment in my experience, prior to that at OMA, there was this obsessiveness about running every possible option to mm. the ground. And that was um, cumbersome. It was often frustrating to clients. You know, Why are we reopening something that we thought we already made a decision on and so forth? And this was a, a on the other hand, that was something that those of us who had gone through that educational experience, um, we also relied on it. Right? It gave us time to think and almost was a crutch. And this was a project where we simply didn't have the time. And so it frankly gave us, in retrospect, much more confidence in our ability to make decisions on intuition. Mm -hmm. To simply say, you know what, we don't have time to make 17 options and to you know, is it the best one? We have to simply look at it 
um, on an almost visceral level decide if we think it is an appropriate decision and move on. Mm -hmm. And so it was equally valuable on that side, you know, to almost undo certain things that we had learned um, in terms of expediency and trusting ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, would you like to talk about that? Uh, kind of the, the process of what prepare you to kind of go into <coughs> this line of experimenting and working and creating details and creating things. Right. But your, your question was also specifically about education. Yes, like and, um, as yeah. you retrace I know, have the a, steps. I have a kind of an inherent sort of conflict because I, I'm an educator and I have been teaching at least for the last 10 years continuously. Uh, but I've been kind of forging my own brand of pedagogy based in part on what I did before founding Front. Mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of an anti-education approach. <laughs> so um, my simple Bachelor of Architectural Professional degree took me 12 years to get. Uh, and what's curious about that is if you actually add up the amount of time spent in school, it's only two years and eight months out of 12 years. And so my, in, I, in between then, I, I worked and lived in about six different cities uh, in Asia and in Europe and in North America. Um, and we were uh, kind of obsessive about building in the first place, architecture in the first place. It was what we were passionate about. So friends uh, in different offices, we would always be visiting each other's offices, construction sites, um, going to factory trips just for the hell of it on the weekend, you know, because someone else was doing a site visit. And it became kind of like this endless culture for that 12 years of, of constantly seeking out um, the the kind of the visceral reality of what it takes to make buildings while being um, I would say profoundly committed to excellence in architecture like that it was because it's too easy for some people to go negative on design yeah and become obsessive about that but I actually think uh, when it comes down to what I'm trying to do at Georgia Tech right now is um, to use the word again which is a word I use all the time instilling students with confidence uh, a critical ability and an understanding of the extents of the frame within which they're operating, which goes all the way to the existential limits of their being. Why are they doing what they're doing? In what kind of paradigm or what kind of, uh, you know, sort of politico economic theory or, uh, you know, um, <laughs> you know, working, working in, in a certain country, in a certain kind of regime, with a certain kind of economic structure is very different from working here. Working in New York is very different from working in Atlanta. I mean, when you start actually getting into the kind of detail and nitty-gritty of where you are, why you're doing what you're doing, and you begin to think critically about it, and you then you combine it with a kind of agenda and a confidence, that's all you can do because architects cannot and will not know everything. Do you advocate for a design-build uh, proximity within schools of architecture? Um, like, do you advocate for for building, like taking the students into um, the building? I, I don't advocate for it because um, in, in the educational context, uh, whether it's an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree or PhD, you've only got a certain amount of resources. Yeah. And you've only got, you, you've got, you know, um, NAB accredited, you've got various kind of uh, accreditations for schools that you have to maintain that are kind of non-negotiable. And within that, there's only so much latitude. Mm -hmm. Okay, but understanding that there are schools that are very design build oriented and there are very schools that are very theory oriented. But even at Princeton, you know, understand the world was basically if you can't theorize practice, theory is irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? So then the idea of critical practice becomes a very kind of, you know, of the moment point. And what are you doing in practice? How are you actually moving it forward in some sort of meaningful way? You know, so my, my studios that I run right now are basically the graduate level studios, final year, 10 students, everyone designs the same project. They're all large scale, complex, vertically integrated projects in different cities. And we force them through a full integrated design process. And it's, uh, it's kind of a uh, Lord of the Flies structure where uh, it's a social experiment because there is no hierarchy and they're basically trained to negotiate with each other and to convince and or respect and or like cajole or subjugate, I mean, depending on what your point of view is. And uh, to get to my kind of final point is uh, Tom Benchelet, who ch sponsors the chair, provides um, tens of thousands of dollars each semester 
to fund um, travel and full-scale prototyping and model making. However, it's clear to my students that they do not have the right to spend that money unless they have absolute conviction about what it is they want to study mm -hmm. at one-to-one -one scale. So if their design is crap and the, and the group of them basically fail to collaborate to actually come up with meaningful results, we're not going to spend the money on their mock-up. Because why would you build a mock-up? A mock-up is some sort of you know, uh, a speculation to say, I'm going to, I want to find out in true empirical terms at full scale the answer to my question. And if your question is a garbage question, then the money's just going to be saved for the next semester. Can, can, as, as a person who's actually um, sat on his final reviews, um, it's extraordinary, even for the projects that are less successful, the, the success isn't necessarily about, okay, we all think it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, no, no. Across the board, every one of the students has a remarkably different understanding than I've ever seen an architecture student have, simply because they've gone through the process of an idea to trying to figure out how to implement it to actually implementing it and they literally build it themselves and they're, you know, Mark is facilitating ordering glass from China and they're understanding, you know, whatever it is, that the discussion that we have is a discussion that's not a, dis it's at a level much higher than I've ever had in an architecture school. With, with, yeah. with, with results that, you know, you might go, oh, okay, but that's ugly or whatever, you know, the, the, the physical things, the tangible things may not have the kind of inherent beauty, that's because they're investigating something that's in a way more important. Very specific and yeah. very... Um, David, you want to comment on the idea of like from making to, to teaching to... You, you're doing a PhD of yeah, on I'm something very teaching. specific. Yeah, I'm, my PhD is concentrated much more on, um, on the scientific aspect of uh, performance-driven design, so... My ultimate goal is, uh, not goal, but the way I test my work is in a wind tunnel testing facility, so you actually see the performance, you collect the data, so it's coming much more from the engineering uh, aspect. And I, I think one of the reasons that I went to a PhD was actually this project, because in a sense, uh, they are, like, like jo Josh was saying, many things, basic, basically the, the fluff cut out. We didn't even have time, the, fat is the cut fluff was basically cut out. Like we didn't have the time to do the meandering that many times happens uh, when you when you deal with something as complex as architecture, which is a like an insane mixture between abstract concepts, uh, social ideas, technological ideas, uh, limitations of material, limitations of time, limitations of management, communications between different uh, disciplines. So in that sense, it was kind of more clean cut. And the other thing was like the multidisciplinary aspect of the, the construction, like it should, I'm sure it didn't come out as Rex was the only part uh, of, the, of the project, but I want to even further emphasize that the, the, the architect is the generalist. He's pretty much tying the entire team that is working on the site, and this could have been a Tower of Babylon like that, but there was something very essential in the relationship between all the all the collaborators, and I think that partly was because of Rex's methodology, where those positions are distilled from the, the reasoning behind decisions is distilled very early on. So after that, the materiality aspect, the material aspect of it is negotiable, but as long as everybody understands what's like the essence of anything, then it's much more easy to discuss. Even if it's not the essence, the sense of a common purpose, yes, and that, you know, it, I refer to it as a consensus, but it's basically this, as you, uh, in your very um, excellent diagram of who was at the site and how you all came together, you see how once all these people commit to a certain part of the work, you get a kind of level of intricacy that, you know, it's, it's just uh, every decision it's tied on other people's scope. And so w sometimes you see these projects unravel in a bad way when, when, when the leader, when, when the person that uh, it's either the architect or the head engineer, it's confused or not, or not with it. And, and it happens kind of quickly that, that you see a kind of a, 
uh, kind of a military operation go, gone bad. And, and in this project, it seems like it was not, it was the opposite, that the kind of the, everyone was there, show up for battle, and kind of things kept moving, moving along. And you see that in the film. Was there any kind of moment where things were um, just tipping on the wrong, on the wrong, and, and it's, my question is to, was there any kind of moment and then what do you do? Do you call, uh, do you call Josh? Do you call the client? Do you call <coughs> the fire department? And what prepare you to make that, this, that decision in your yeah. education? Yeah. Was um, there ever a moment in which something was not going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the better question. Um, yeah, I mean, going on site, I, mean, I was 28 when I went to the site. I was a year and a half out of school. Which school? I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, and the school I went to, we, um, it's, it was very unique because we had a work, wood shop that was the size of uh, an aircraft hangar. So we had the unique opportunity to build things uh, at real scale. Often, you know, single story, double story. A lot of people do their thesis on entire houses in Buffalo because the housing market is, there's a surplus. So I went there, I mean, I have a kind of knack for assembly and I think that helped me a lot. But I also went there with a year and a half of experience and everything I learned was learning for the first time. Yeah. Um, and it was an incredible experience. But I think that in terms of design, we took a lot of decisions that were um, instinctual and the way that we approached the design was not to solve everything, but to solve the concept even materially, like when we think about what is an object, how is it clad, we had concepts in our mind and we set principles for those concepts. And so when we went to the site and we were challenged with uh, issues, details, we were able to address them, uh, I won't say easily, but we were able to address them by sticking through those concepts that we had established uh, in the design Can concept. Can I add something sure. to this? Um, uh, just to illustrate one of the points that Deb was making as well about um, decisions being made early and having a good rationale. I, d I just want to highlight for the audience that the, the development it took to make that slump, you know, insulated, point fixed glass, uh, I, I would say on a project of this time frame, it's not normally achievable. Mm -hmm. It's quite simply not. I mean, it takes usually longer. I mean, you're into a process of of, of experiment and, and you usually are doing so much kind of um, value engineering and optioneering along the way that the fact that the party of the building was established like in the first couple of days on that weekend when we met, uh, that there would be a ring. And we worked on Caltech together as well, so we understood that um, there was budget issues on Caltech and that box became incredibly repetitive and incredibly kind of distilled because of the economics. Uh, and it, it worked. I mean, it was kind of on budget. Um, so for Rocco, with the, the fact that the box was clean, because that, I, that moment was identified as special, and because this idea about its special materiality evolved really very, very early on, it gave everyone a chance to succeed at that. I mean, if you think about most projects going through concept, schematic, and design development, even the basic diagram of that could be up for grabs all the way through design development. And here it was essentially locked down and established in the first week, okay. allowing for the rest of that to actually unfold within this kind of 13 month time frame. And that, that is special. Um, uh, my question actually comes right up to that point. Um, all of you have mentioned that, um, I mean, the success factor is that the project was completed in a very short allocated time. Um, <coughs> I was wondering, um, because this is also the headquarters of a big business, um, how were the functions of this building as a headquarter uh, negotiated and how was it mediated that the f um, and who was in charge of planning the functions of the building actually um, mediated with the presence um, that is this signature building for Bacco basically. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. <coughs> we should all answer that at some point. But um, there wasn't, in a way, there wasn't a lot of um, room for debate. 
uh, of, of the two major components, Vaco and Power Media, Power Media couldn't go offline for very long. And so Power Media, and it also, it was almost a um, providence that we had a building that was an object sitting on a large horizontal two-story parking structure, which is ideal for, given its construction, for creating sound studios and things that neither want daylight nor um, vibrations. So it very quickly put Power Media into the plinth. Mm -hmm. um, and we also needed for the, the plinth to go online and to be operating, I can't remember how many, four months or something into the process. So, you know, for nine months of construction, they were completely operating Power Media in the building. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, so that might sound crazy that you could do it in that short amount of time. On the other hand, um, because the companies are very, um, uh, they have a, a they're very, they have a patriarch, <laughs> and a patriarch makes all decisions. Mm -hmm. um, there are only a few people we had to deal with in order to decide, okay, this is the layout of each floor, mm -hmm. um, who will go on which floors, what are the prime functions. Those are things that literally we could hash out you know, in a meeting with Jem and one or two other key people in a two-hour meeting. Mm -hmm. And yes, those things got edited, but <coughs> they only got edited in relationship to something that actually had already been agreed. So like, oh wait, you know, we want to take uh, this design group and move it down here and this other one and move it up there and we can move some partitions. But it, it wasn't a kind of, you know, typical board's process with approvals and then reapprovals and then people change their mind. And it was super fast. And it's probably worth noting, it's kind of <coughs> self-evident in the project, but um, the basic partie of the VACO side of it, of course, broke into the wolf in sheep's clothing. And one is offices oriented, the other one is conference rooms and auditorium oriented. So that also kind of immediately takes this kind of Caltech precedent, meets this other building that has this plinth plus box massing. And all of a sudden you've got no, on, not only kind of identity break up within the Vaco side, you've clearly got public versus kind of private zoning already working kind of diagrammatically in the first week. Mm -hmm. And so at that point it's really a question of well, whose office goes where, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think in more in general, uh, we found ourselves in a kind of strange position in Vaco more, to, more, more towards the end. Uh, and I'd, I'd like actually to start from Caltech. Caltech, for me, that's the project that I joined the, joined the firm, and I got exposed to an insane rigorousness when it comes to designing the typology or cultural typology in the intellectual endeavor that goes into the organizational spatial relationship, temporal relationship to how people function, perception, uh, an institution defines itself, a brand uh, communicates itself, all these aspects that are, have to do much more about uh, or with the way that things happen or the, things, the, the way that things operate. So there was an insane amount of, of thinking on typology and typology translates many times on, uh, into program. And what was even more intense was the client, which I don't know if Caltech is probably one of the four academic institutions lead, leading in the world. Uh, they were so into it. There was actually a serendipity programmatic, like 640 feet for serendipity. Mm -hmm. So which is, it just explains the kind of, of client that you have. I think when we got to VACO, there was so much thinking already that has been done, and the time constraints seemed to be such a challenge that mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not sure that we were so uh, focused on that, especially that the, the the client was al already asking for a very rich programmatic uh, kind of program. The the awkward position was that as the project developed, the client started to fall in love more and more and to gain confidence and to start to understand that actually what he's doing is uh, he's doing beyond the uh, headquarters for his own company, he's starting to do an, a cultural icon for the city. Mm -hmm. So suddenly he wanted to have a French institution where you can actually bring somebody from the EU into a museum that becomes into a library that <coughs> is actually going to be open for students. So basically the program started to kind of, to be, to kind of flourish. 
uh, which introduced another layer of complexity of pathfinding, how do you provide security for different audiences coming into the building, but in a way we were, I think, very intrigued and we're also less familiar with the cultures, with the culture itself in, in terms of the wants and what's kind of very contemporary. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were intrigued by his passion and I think we're trying to accommodate that as much as possible. I, I'm going to ask, is there, is there anyone that would like to ask a question before we adjourn tonight? Yes? I can, I, mean it's, I, I can only speak for myself and our practice that uh, it was a watershed moment that allowed us to work with greater speed and confidence and not obsess to the degree that we had done previously. Do you think that's playing back into the way you work now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that now we, we have much more confidence that, okay, you know what? For these various reasons, this is the direction we're going. Period. We don't need to validate seventy other ones to, or to fail, have seventy other ones fail in order to validate this one. We now have a much stronger sense since that experience of, for all these reasons, that works. Let's move. You know. I, I would I would say that the um, with with experience comes a respect for the unique velocity of any given project. Uh, and you start understanding that, uh, you know, if if if a, if a project takes a decade to build and design, it's probably for very specific reasons, and then you don't get upset about that. You just begin to become more respectful of why it is, what kind of approvals, what decisions, what bidding procedures, uh, etc., that have to happen. At the same time, projects that have hyper acceleration are always for very very strong, powerful reasons. And the more I think you become interested in time and how much time it takes to do anything in architecture, I think you just become a very good architect. That's, I mean, I think that's a very good point that, you know, that we have these schematic design development, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, facing, and we allocate a certain amount of time, and there are very specific uh, Na uh, reasons for very different natures to, to modify that timeline. And I think it's incumbent on us to remain more flexible to those uh, potential things. And I, I would say just on that point, and this is something we share a lot, all of us, is that we become also very um, versed in how to write contracts yes. to manage variable timeline projects. And, and when you know how to do it, it actually encourages people to work with you because uh, if you're clueless when it comes to an accelerated project or a really long one, you'll totally price yourself out and you won't get the work. Absolutely. Or you'll take on too much or too little risk. By example, don't ever give a lump sum for construction administration. <laughs> Just give them a Down monthly base. rate. They want to draw it out for seven years. <laughs> Let them not <laughs> dead. Could you explain the uh, cocoon roof structure for the Caltech project? Was it to be an inflated fabric, or was there some structure to it? Uh, it, it was a, in, in various moments, um, it was a, a pillowed uh, ETFE structure in the final one. So it was one, one large piece of the plastic, basically? Or? Uh, yes, but uh, in, in the final one, I think it was maybe five five rows, but then because the geometry is also doing this, it was something like maybe 15 pillows. So it's kind of a takeoff on the water cube from Beijing, I guess, a little bit. A takeoff on the, on water, the water cube? On the water cube from Beijing Olympics. <laughs> predated. It, it predated it by about <laughs> three years. I just have a very quick question. I mean, there's no doubt that the project is fantastic. I mean, it's um, bold in its expression and its simplicity and it uses technology, um, problem solving approach and everything. But I'm just curious as to um, how the building was received by the people in the city or in the community because a challenge that comes with working in a foreign country um, is how the building gets received eventually 
Um, I mean, it is a fashion store, so I'm, I'm assuming there are tons of customers too. Um, to be clear, it's, a, it's a, the headquarters for a fashion company. Okay. Um, but we, we can't say how it would be received. I mean, there are various Istanbul. Maybe you can. Um, yeah. Türkiye'de çok mu edildi? Ya şey oldu. Evet oldu ve şey herkes bundan çok bahsetti. Şöyle söyleyebilirim. Çevireyim. Sen çevirsin. Okay so şöyle diyebilirim. Bu hikayeler kimse tarafından bilinmiyor ve bina çok beğenildi. Vakko da bununla gurur duyuyor. Yes, so, um, I mean, none of these stories about the sh short, um, short uh, building time and all of these stories are not known, but for Vakko it became a signature building and um, they are very proud of it and everywhere they go, basically it's like the, um, it's like the image that they use uh, for the new face of the company because it's a company with a long heritage, like Joshua said, and this was basically the gesture that made them contemporary. Is it widely understood in the general public of the city? This um, it's it's not. Uh, it's a little bit far farther down. It's not central. Eski binaları çok yoğun dedi herkes gördü. Fakat bu harika bir tepede fakat ağaçlarla. Yes, their old building used to be in the very very center of the uh, of the town. Um, this is actually uh, amongst trees um, up on a hill. So it's actually visible, um, not so much visible as the other building, but they tend to use it a lot. So I guess everybody knows that this is the, the headquarters from the images. For, for public events. Like and also, of course they use it for events. public events. Yes, they use it for public events. The auditorium is used for festivals. Um, so before the building that they used to have um, was not sort of a public building. I think after the architecture became um, a signature ar architecture, they started using it publicly. Let me add one thing to that, which is that you know, don't, don't underestimate the value of a shrewd client. You know, Jem himself is a very creative, very ambitious person. And he also understands how, because he's also built quite a bit, um, how projects can become um, culturally unreceived or poorly received. And this is going to sound like a silly thing, but he was very clear to articulate when there were cultural tropes that we could not, you know, w wouldn't work. By example, as an American, the color taupe, beige, like it's something really anathema. You know, it means um, 1980s bathrooms in suburban Atlanta. You know, that's what the color means to us. In Turkey, it's actually a very refined, elegant color. Mm -hmm. And he had to be very clear, you know, look, you can't simply transplant your American New York aesthetic here. You have, so he took us to 20 different places in the city that he thought had elegance and simply pointed out why here in this culture that is interpreted as elegance. So we would understand a different palette. Uh, please, uh, I just want to know uh, the technical problems you face by uh, using the glass, especially the sloping glass. Uh, I'm sorry, what? The technical. Uh, the technical problems you face by using glass. What hmm? technical problems do you face uh, by using a slump glass? Um, well, as, as I tried to explain in my brief talk, um, the, the challenges are, are one, to make a responsible insulated glass unit that performs with a high performance, low emissivity coating. And to do that in a kind of uh, a very refined, smooth, architectural language is typically incompatible and and to to make an architecture that works with both is unusual and so 
you know, these, these problems that I talk about, about the heat buildup in the air cavity, uh, conventional wisdom says you always make an air cavity in an insulated glass unit, maybe half inch to three quarters of an inch, maybe one inch. Uh, as soon as you start building it up to something that's thick, the convection currents start to build up, the heat starts to build up. First of all, if there's convection currents, it just means that the glass isn't doing its job. It's no longer an effective insulator because it's actually moving the cold to one side from the other side. Um, and so you actually have to maintain a certain thinness in the cavity so that the temperature stratification from one side to the other stays constant. And so the amount of deformation or increase in volume that we created with the X was small enough that we didn't have that issue. And we had to prove that. Um, we even had issues with, you know, where was it insulated, what altitude was it insulated at, what temperature would it be insulated at. You know, and having it all made locally was a very good thing. Um, we also had some challenges working with the local fabricator, coming to a meeting of the minds in terms of the engineering of the panels. You know, at some points it's like, we want to do it our way. At some point we're saying, but we insist that it be engineered like this. Uh, you know, so there is a bit of kind of give and take, but everyone had to, within a short amount of time, come to a consensus that it was sensible, that it was going to work. Uh, and, and even we weren't really in favor of the integrated fitting on the back of the glass uh, because we were more comfortable with uh, this kind of clamped idea, uh, clamping the inside light of an insulated unit, but to them that seemed like a really esoteric, risky idea. You know, even if we built things like that in Switzerland, they're kind of like, yeah, so what? This is Turkey. We like the integrated fitting. We're comfortable with it. We're proud that we know how to do it. And we're going to move forward on that basis. And everyone was like, yeah, okay. Good. That sounds good. That sounds good. Can I finish this yes. with one quick anecdote for any of the students in the room, which is um, you know, everything that Mark just said about the technical uh, aspects that led to that particular design and what I talked about in terms of the strengthening and the pins and so forth leading to the X, none of that was actually presented to the client as a reason to do it. The reason to do it, I told you that he wanted to have his name on the building and we simply said, it's Vaco, Vaco, Vaco, Vaco, Vaco, Vaco. And voila, he thought it was amazing and that was it. Actually, we, we thought it was REX, REX, REX. Also. And they had an arm wrestle. Is there a last burning question before we adjourn? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.